Um, hey everyone, both in the room and over Zoom. Um, thanks for another, I think, third to last iteration of the Learning Machine Seminar for this calendar year. Um, we're really lucky to have you and Chen. Um, uh, Professor Chen is at Harvard as part of um, the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences and sort of affiliated with a whole bunch of sort of things there. I sort of all mentioned a few of them, including the Center for Research on Computation and Society. Um, Ewing is sort of you know, very prominent in machine learning, econ CS, and a whole lot of different fields, sort of has won a whole bunch of awards, but sort of um, situates her research at the intersection of computer science and economics, especially in the emerging area of social computing, where human creativity and resources are harnessed for the purpose of computational tasks. And I'll let her talk about what she's going to talk about. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for having me here. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, a question that we call forecast aggregation. It appears to be a very simple question, um, but it has been demonstrated to be quite challenging in practice. And what I'm going to talk about is that we want to look at a setting that say how much samples if we want a data driven algorithm to do the aggregation and we try to look at the sample complexity of the problem. And then we're going to look at the more practical setting. That is that we actually only have the forecast. Um, sorry, is this okay? Yes, I think okay. I'll do it. <laughs> um, So we only have the forecast from uh, participants or experts, and we have no other information. Can we still try to improve uh, the accuracy of the aggregation? So let me uh, dive into it. Uh, so this is about forecasting. And forecasting is like a ubiquitous, it's everywhere. So as simple as we can ask, uh, will uh, tomorrow rain um, in New York City? Oh, there have been like questions asking, oh, so when will Amazon.com start to accept some cryptocurrency for purchases on the website? So will that happen um, before October 1st this year? And so you might have also heard that like people are trying to make forecast on geopolitical questions. So for example, um, the third one was a question that was that has been asked before. Uh, so will North Korea launch a new multi-stage missile before a specific date? Oh, um, more recently, even scientists, they're trying to get uh, predictions of forecast uh, on the credibility of uh, scientific finding. So you probably heard about um, in psychology and some other social science domains, uh, people are trying to replicate that has already, uh, so papers that have already been published and say whether the replication will reproduce the same conclusion in the same direction as the original study. And it's a very costly process such that people are trying to say that whether um, researchers in the community can actually generate accurate forecast for the replication outcome of scientific studies. So in fact, uh, um, so there has been several, uh, mostly IAP and DAPA funded, very large forecasting competition that happened in the last decade. So, so the first one was the IAP has ACE forecasting competition. So it lasted four years and its focus was mainly trying to get more accurate forecast from human participants. So, um, so during the four years uh, period, um, forecasters were generating forecast for over 600 um, forecasting questions. And, and the total number of participants is around like uh, the order of like 15,000 participants. And for this particular pro uh, project, uh, the type of forecasting questions are mainly geopolitical or some are economics related questions. Um, and then um, a few years ago, so IAP had launched another forecasting competition that's called hybrid forecasting competition. Mm -hmm. Um, and the intention was that, oh, so we can have humans to generate forecast, but we also want to say that whether machines can help with generating more accurate forecast and say whether a hybrid human machine system can further improve uh, the accuracy of the forecast that's being generated. 
And uh, at least in the first phase of this competition, which lasts for seven months, um, so every month there are like 25 new forecasting questions that's being posted by IAPA, and participants need to generate daily forecast for those questions. Um, and DAPA joined like uh, for having uh, its scout program, and this scout program was mainly for uh, generating prediction on the um, replicability of social science studies. So they selected uh, 30,000 articles that were published between the year of 2009 and 2018, and representing like 62 journals from like 10 disciplines. Um, and then they actually had a team that was dedicated to replicating 10% of these articles. So some of the replication are still ongoing. The outcome hasn't been uh, released, but they want predictions for all 30,000 articles. So as you can see that the scale is really large. And these are really challenging questions because only 10% of the articles are actually being replicated. And hence that only those 10% when the replication is completed, will actually know the outcome of the replication. But for the remaining 90% of the articles, we don't even know like the, the outcome of the uh, replication because a replication was not even attempted. And the replication tends to be very expensive. So not only just financially, but also like in terms of the time cost, it takes like usually more than a year to replicate a research project. Um, so hopefully I have uh, convinced you that there are a lot of interesting forecasting questions. Um, but for this talk, I actually want to highlight that we can ask uh, uh, people to generate forecast. Uh, but if you look at this particular example, so this is an example that's coming from the goodjudgmentopen.com, the jjopen.com. Uh, they're constantly running this type of like a, a forecasting uh, like uh, not competition. So they're solicitating forecast from participants on uh, various questions. And this is just one question that I got from the website. And the point that I want to highlight here is that it's not like that I ask you to give me a forecast for this particular question, because for this particular question, there has been like more than 500 forecasters that has already provided a forecast. And the chances are they disagree with each other a lot. Um, but if I'm solicitating information at the end, I really only want one most accurate forecast. So there is an aggregation problem here. That is how to combine multiple forecasts together into a single forecast. And hopefully that single forecast is the best that I can possibly get in terms of accuracy. So that's the uh, forecast aggregation problem. And all the previous examples of the forecasting competition, they all face this aggregation problem because they're not solicitating a prediction from a single expert. They're always soliciting prediction from multiple experts. So how to do aggregation? And it's very tempting to think that, so now machine learning is so powerful, so we can possibly have very complicated way of doing aggregation. Um, but interestingly, there seems to be a forecast, a forecast combination puzzle. That is that in practice, the simple aggregators often outperform the more complicated aggregators. And by simple, I really mean extremely simple. So the reliable one are the either the unweighted <coughs> mean or sometimes um, so for example, the good judgment project, they're using a weighted mean, but the weights were determined in a very delicate way. <coughs> so they have complicated survey of personalities of its participants, uh, and then eventually determine the weights on, on like individuals forecast. So they have, but the simple ones are really the weighted mean. Um, and I think the more recent years, people have already uh, also noticed that uh, when doing aggregation, if you try to bring uh, either the individual prediction or the aggregated prediction to the extremes, meaning that like for binary predictions, if we're reporting a probability for binary events, that means that bringing the prediction to be closer to one or closer to zero, so called extremifying, 
So that often generates more accurate prediction. So a lot of aggregators are kind of just doing that. And uh, uh, the logic mean, the weighted logic means is one that uh, has been tested in practice that's doing this type of extremifying and has been demonstrated to be um, perf uh, to have good performance in practice. So what it works is that we just take the logic of the probability that someone report, which is the, for binary events, it's the log of P uh, like over one minus P. And then we take the mean of that and we can like normalize that or kind of have parameterize that and then use the sigmoid function to map that back to uh, a probability. So that's the, the logic mean. So these are really simple uh, aggregators. So one can always adopt it. Um, so it's very tempting to, to think that, oh, maybe there are data-driven aggregators that can work better. So like, it's really hard to imagine that like, uh, we don't have very good algorithm that can solve this like, apparently very simple question better, right? Um, so there are many reasons to justify why we haven't really seen very successful data-driven aggregators. So one reason to think about the geopolitical uh, questions is that, <coughs> oh, the questions doesn't have a lot of regularity in the sense of uh, uh, the historical questions doesn't really contain much information about the future questions. And usually if we're thinking about a data-driven method, we're really thinking about that oh, history actually contains useful information for the future. And hence we can like, learn those information from historical data. So that's a very valid reason of thinking that, oh, we just don't really have informative historical data. Um, but we do have settings that um, we can argue that, oh, we do have a lot of historical data and probably uh, historical data also contains a lot of information. So for example, if we just think about like weather forecasting, so that happens every day, clearly it is a setting that we do have a lot of data and arguably, if we're thinking about the same location, historical data um, contributes a lot of information to the future. When you're saying historical data, do you mean like, I can identify who the super forecasters <coughs> are based on their previous forecasts or are you, or this like weather example seems to be that you're more talking about like, I can just predict the underlying effect. Yeah, so I think by uh, talking about historical data, I think the most ideal case is that uh, I know each one's prediction and I actually observe the outcome of those events and hence know how well they performed in the past. So in some sense, I can actually learn the expertise level or how well a particular forecaster is from the historical data. So, so I think there are many reasons for like a, for certain settings, we probably don't expect a data-driven aggregator may work better uh, just because of the historical data is not informative enough. Um, but we're kind of uh, curious of asking the question of uh, if we have a, a very learning friendly environment, so we do have access to the historical data, can we uh, take a data-driven approach and do aggregation well? Uh, so essentially, we want to ask the question of, uh, is aggregation fundamentally difficult for a data-driven approach, even if we have uh, access to a large amount of data? And uh, we're asking this question basically by saying, uh, what's the sample complexity? So how, um, like, what's the size of the data that's necessary for us to really get a very good aggregator? And for this question, we're essentially pushing toward one direction of saying that let's think about the, the best possible scenario for learning algorithm to work. So we have everything. So there is an underlying distribution that we can try to learn and we do have access to the historical data. Um, it turns out that like for general distributions, um, the sample complexity is exponential. So I'm, again, I'm going to talk about the, the details. For special cases, uh, we do not need a large number of data. So this kind of gave a, a negative answer of saying that, oh, the aggregation problem itself uh, is fundamentally hard. 
if we're thinking about a data-driven approach. Um, and then we're moving toward the second question is that, so given that, what can we do? Like, because we still have those forecasting questions that we're very interested in generating accurate forecast and uh, we're facing the aggregation problem. And in many of the cases, we actually don't have access to the historical data. So we're pushing it toward the other uh, spectrum of uh, we only have forecast, but we have no access to the historical data. So is there anything that we still can do to improve the aggregation accuracy? So what I'm going to talk about is the, the first, I'm going to quickly talk about the sample complexity um, work. So I will just lay out the model and define the question and uh, state our main result. I'm not going to go into the, the proofs of how we got the results. Um, and then we're moving to the a second question is that um, we want to demonstrate that we actually can leverage um, a family of economic mechanism that was originally designed for eliciting information truthfully when we do not have access to the ground truth and use that as a way of evaluating the quality of the forecast and, and hence have a way of like selecting experts and using the base aggregators uh, based on that to improve the accuracy of the aggregator. So I'm going to talk about um, like uh, essentially like a two extreme of the forecast aggregation problem. So let me quickly talk about the sample complexity of forecast aggregation. Um, so as I mentioned that we essentially want to start this problem in the nicest possible environment for learning algorithm. So if you think that my model is stylish uh, and like in real world, this is not always going to be satisfied. I think that's fine because even in this nicest possible environment, we still need exponential amount of samples to learn an aggregator well, okay? So let me try to set up the model here. So here's me, I want to uh, get an accurate prediction for a question. And just to suppose that my question is that, um, will tomorrow rain or not? So this is a binary question. And uh, what I can do is that, um, I would suppose zero says it's sunny tomorrow. And um, what I'm going to do is that I can ask a bunch of the experts. And this experts, they have access to some signal. So this is the Bayesian model. So they have access some signal as the eye. And uh, based on their signal, and also based on the prior of the state of the word omega, so they can generate a forecast. So that's going to be the RI. So RI is their posterior belief about the probability that tomorrow is going to be raining, okay? And then they each tell me this report. So there's no manipulation. So let's just suppose that they're truthful. Our data is the best possible data that we can get. Uh, and then I have a bunch of this like a report from the experts. So my question is that um, what function of the aggregators I can use to generate a final forecast. And I want this final forecast to be as accurate as possible. Um, and one way of measuring the accuracy of the forecast is let's just minimize uh, the squared error of the forecast. Um, and then I have to have a benchmark. So what do I mean that um, my aggregator is accurate? So my benchmark is what a Bayesian aggregator can possibly generate when the Bayesian aggregator has access to all the reports and know the prior. So notice that there is a, a, like a slight difference between knowing all the report from knowing all the information. Here, we're just saying that the Bayesian aggregator know all the report and also knowing the prior, where me as 
the, the real aggregator, I have no idea of what the prior is. I'm only having access to uh, the, the forecast. So, so the P star is going to be the Bayesian optimal aggregator. That's the ideal target for us. So we're trying to look at um, whether we can get closer to this ideal aggregator P star. So that's uh, the that's goal here. Um, and it's important that I don't know this prior. So I have no knowledge of this prior, um, but I want to be able to uh, like learn from the samples that I have. Okay. So, go ahead. Yeah, in the previous slide, um, instead of using probabilities, can we use it as a weight and load it backwards using back preparation? So, which one as the weight? Uh, from exports to me. Can I use it as a weight instead of R1 equal to like instead of using probabilities? Can I use weights here and then load it as a parameter like neural network? Oh, interesting. Um, I think uh, uh, so. The aggregator can be very different. So the reason that we choose this uh, like a report as the posterior of the individual uh, is because of uh, uh, we want to have a very clear benchmark. And because this is the Bayesian model, so the Bayesian model, the benchmark is very clear. So what's optimal is very clear. So if we do something as you suggested, um, so there's nothing like a wrong way of doing that. It's just, it's unclear what would be the, the optimal benchmark for me. So I'm setting up this as the Bayesian model, uh, just because of like, the, in the nicest possible world, if everyone is Bayesian, they're all rational. I have no error like contributing like, a, like from the ages. Uh, I got the perfect predictions from them. Can I do aggregation well? So that, that's kind of the question that we're asking here. Uh, so should, should I be assuming that like everyone has the same prior in this model or? Yeah, in the Bayesian model, like because they, uh, so the drawing the distribution is the prior. So uh -huh. everyone has the same drawing distribution. Yeah. Okay, so now let me talk about the, the data-driven approach. So what do I mean by the, uh, like uh, starting the sample complexity of this problem? Um, so we're thinking that like uh, uh, a sample is the combination of an event. So it's kind of like a drawing and also the realized report from all my experts. So essentially, uh, if it just to, Underlying drawn distribution is P. A sample is the combination of ever agents report and the actual realized outcome of that event. So we do observe the event outcome. So you can think about a sample as um, the weather forecast of a bunch of agents and the eventual weather outcome on a particular day. Okay. And we have uh, a bunch of such samples. And we're asking the question of uh, um, if we try to aggregate, um, like looking for a good aggregator of our reports. So based on the samples that we have access to, can we do well? And the optimal Bayesian aggregator I've already mentioned is this ideal one. So it's a, uh, um, it's a prob posterior probability conditioning on uh, O agents report. Okay. Um, so the sample complexity is uh, essentially we're looking at the number of samples we need to learn an absolute optimal aggregator F hat with high probability. So with probability one minus delta. Um, and then what does it mean by absolute optimal. So it's absolute optimal in terms of the, uh, the squared loss. So essentially the, uh, the expected error of my aggregator F hat compared with the expected error of the optimal Bayesian aggregator. So measured in terms of the squared loss, uh, the difference is uh, less than or equal to absolute. So that's a, that's a goal. Okay. Um, so that's the setup. So that's essentially, we set up a very stylized model. 
And uh, arguably, we think that this model is like giving all the advantage of like learning algorithm can possibly like do the job. And we want to say that even in this very nice environment, uh, do we need a, a large number of samples to learn a good enough app hat? Um, and let me just uh, state the main result. So, so we give the sample complexity upper bound and lower bound. And as you can see that, uh, so M is the size of each agent's signal space. So remember that, like we said that each agent observes some uh, realization of some random signal and then report his posterior as the report. And M is the size of the signal space. And N is the number of agents. Um, and if I drop the, the log term, as you can see that the, uh, the sample complexity lower bound is M to the power of N minus two over epsilon. And uh, the upper bound is M to the power of N over epsilon square. Okay, so, so this is uh, for general distribution. So there is no assumption has made for what the distribution P looks like. So this doesn't look very good. So pretty bad uh, sample complexity bound here. Um, and I'll just quickly mention that the, uh, the proof for this is the reduction from the problem of uh, distribution learning in terms of the total variation distance. So the intuition here is that, oh, so if I want to learn the optimal Bayesian aggregator F star, this is just as difficult as learning the entire distribution P uh, if we make no assumptions on the structure of P. So for general distribution. So we, we really don't have any advantage of just learning an aggregator here. Um, but we do have a special case. And, and you can argue about it that the special case holds in many applications. So this special case is saying that if the prior P is um, satisfied the conditional independence condition. So what it means is that uh, if I think about each X per signal, so that signal condition on the true realization of the omega is independent with each other. <coughs> it's like the probability of S conditional on omega, it's independent across the ages. That's what we mean by conditionally independent distribution. So if that's the case, we can do better. As you can see that for the general distribution, uh, we can't really do very well. We need a very large number of samples. And uh, this intuitively is because of, we need to estimate the conditional correlation between signals. Um, and when the signals are conditionally independent, we don't need to estimate that. So we have much better sample complexity here. So the upper bound and lower bound, so we drop the logarithmic term here, uh, doesn't even depends on the number of signals and the number of agents here. So, so this is a case that we can possibly do uh, well with relatively small samples. At the intuitive level, how should we think about um, Let's say there are some better forecasts there, but what is M here? Yeah, M is uh, because in a, in, a, uh, in a standard Bayesian model, uh, let's just take the question as uh, we want to predict whether tomorrow is going to be rainy or not. So like one or zero. Uh, and then each individual may have some private signal. So maybe my private signal is that uh, I'm going to be able to observe whether today is sunny or not. Um, and I'm going to be able to like ask a friend and a friend may tell me some information about it. So the, the signal is, uh, is essentially a random variable that's correlated with the, uh, the outcome of ego. And the size of the random variable for many events, you really think that like it's actually reasonable to think that could be pretty large. Okay, so the data inputs. Sorry. The signals or data inputs. Uh, the signals are the inputs to the experts, to the human agents. So the signals or data from inputs, like uh, 
the inputs uh, like x y everything yeah you can you can really like uh, practically think about that like anything can be signal realization yeah okay. i'm just trying to confirm that i understand the two extreme cases so um the conditional independent is sort of like basically no one's communicating to each other and sort of no one's sharing it from like sort of it's not like everyone's using the same biased information or something yeah. and then the general distribution is there can be arbitrary correlation exactly talking of it. yeah do you think that there's sort of are there provable stuff in between like that's this? a good question so we, we leave okay. that as open question we wasn't able to really uh find another um so we haven't been able to so let me put it this way we haven't spent too much time on that but we haven't been able to really think about what would be the reason about uh like middle cases so what would be the information structure uh that's kind of like a useful to describe the real world but at the same time have like a better sample complexity because those would be the cases that really thinking about that oh these are the scenarios where we can expect that there's still hope for a data-driven method to do aggregation well so yeah we don't have any result for the middle case but i think that's a big open question here so what would be the um how to close the gap is uh, where exactly where does the gap becomes like really unbearable okay. so, follow-up question on sort of this last thing you said on how much we can like sort of the the impossibility is like compared to the equation optimal right but do you have a sense of like how much better you can do in either of these cases just like comparing to like the mean of the reports or yeah that's a good question um no i don't have anything theoretical that we can state uh, with respect to this it's just a comparing with the the simple aggregator just taking the average right yeah no i don't have there's also a tricky thing of uh, um because which every sample as the the outcome of the event and also all agents report there is also a trade-off between the number of agents that i get predictions from for each event versus like uh, the number of samples that I have. If I have like fewer agents um, and possibly like more tasks, <coughs> like what's the, like what type of like sample complexity or what's the trade-off that we can get? Um, I think those are all really interesting questions. Yeah. Is there a way to like encourage or induce agents to get conditionally independent response? And like, would that be a good idea? That's a good question. That's a really good question is that uh, encouraging them to acquire information in a certain way um, such that the condition is more likely to be set. Um, I think for some cases that may like uh, work or make sense, but for some other cases, I think for forecasting, um, most of people's mentality is that I don't even know what information is out there. So I'm happy to get whatever information that you have. Uh, so so for forecasting is also quite challenging in the sense of uh, we really don't know what the benchmark is because especially when we're trying to get information or get predictions from people. So I could be asking a room of people who are experts on the topic and I get a, they have a lot of information. Or I could be asking like a group of people, they have no clue about the event. And I, I couldn't really tell like uh, which group of people they're really good at forecasting uh, for the current problem and which doesn't. So there is an issue of like, uh, we're happy with whatever information that you can have, but just to factor that in. Um, and we'll be very happy to encourage you to get additional information to refine your prediction. Um, but it's very difficult to uh, say that, sorry, we don't want some information because it's not going to be conditionally independent. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I guess one more thing. It's like, it seems like, for example, um, yeah, if, if you have a general distribution, you have to estimate the, the conditional dependent structure. But also, like, if you have conditionally independent signals, then it seems like you have to figure out how how to use lots of different information. And maybe like one middle case is like, if some people are using the exact same information, 
like everyone is doing, <coughs> if everyone uses the fact that it was sunny today and they try, try to forecast tomorrow, then is there something you can say about, like, like it feels like that should be easier to figure out how to aggregate, like you just throw right. out everyone except for one person. Yeah, exactly. So there is a, uh, another theoretical model that has been uh, explored by researchers looking at uh, forecast aggregation. That's kind of like a, um, because conditional independence is like conditional on the outcome. Uh, you and me get independent signals. So like we have this, we, we may have like a uh, different realization of the signal, even if we all go to say the, uh, ask the same friend, so for example. So conditional independence will, will mean that, right? And, and the other model is to say that um, agents may have correlated uh, information, even condition on the outcome of the event. Um, but essentially there are some base events, so or base signals, and each agent may observe a subset of the base signals. And uh, if you observe like a more like base signals and including what I observed, uh, so our signal realizations are correlated, uh, but it's correlated in a very structured way. So I think that's kind of the probably the next tractable, possibly tractable model to explore. And it's also quite reasonable to think about the word like that. Yeah. Okay, so let me get into the, uh, the reality part. <laughs> the, the pure assessments based aggregation, this is the approach that we're tackling. Um, so we're really throwing ourselves back to the other extreme of saying that I don't really want to make a lot of assumptions. And in many cases, there's just simply no access to historical data. So all we have is that we may have a bunch of agents, like all the experts, and we have a bunch of questions. And this generally is the case for the forecasting competition that I described. And not every agent's answer like gave a prediction for every question. But there are certainly like for each question, there are uh, more than one or there are like many agents who have um, provided forecast for that question. And uh, each agent also provide forecast for many questions. But uh, these are all that we have. So we do not know the outcome of question number one, question number two, or question number four. We just have no ground truth for our questions. Um, so you can argue that this is a minimal information setting. So this is kind of like the bare bone. All we have is just uh, the forecast from the experts. We have no other information. And we want to ask the question is that, is this possible to still improve aggregation? So is there anything that we can do to still improve aggregation? Um, so it's clearly a, a quite challenging question and uh, and I want to set the expectation right, because a lot of people when uh, thinking about aggregation, uh, they're really motivated to find a best aggregator that works for every scenario. And I would think that's not the right expectation when we have access to so little information. So instead, what we think might be helpful is think about that we want to have robust aggregators that performs generally well across different scenarios. So really, I think improve accuracy, like accuracy really means that uh, across a large number of scenarios, the aggregator can have good performance, not necessarily being the best on every single scenario, but generally is a good aggregator. And our approach is that we're actually uh, inspired by the peer prediction <clears throat> literature. And also, we've been working on peer prediction mechanism too. And these are the mechanisms that were intended to focusing on provide the right incentives for eliciting agents information. So it was more like an incentive mechanism. But we want to pivot such mechanism for evaluating the quality of the forecast. Um, and let me just uh, quickly mention what pure prediction mechanism uh, looks like. So the pure prediction mechanisms are really essentially look very similar to the problem that we're having, except that the focus is that how can we make each agent to report their true probability? So the focus is on elicitation. Um, and uh, 
It's also designed for a setting that there is no access to the ground truth. So I'm going to get to the case of when we have access to the ground truth, the elicitation problem is very easy. But when we don't have access to the ground truth, the pure prediction mechanisms can still allow us to do something. Um, but basically, the pure prediction mechanism is just to take the report of the agents and try to calculate a reward. And I want to design the reward in a way such that truthfully report an agent's um, belief is the reward maximizing strategy for the agents. So you can imagine that the, it's focusing on the incentives. Um, so, so I'm going to take a, a surrogate scoring rule, which is a mechanism that we designed for the pure prediction problem as an example. And just to give you some uh, like intuition, why we're thinking that the pure prediction mechanism can actually be leveraged uh, to quantify the quality of the predictions. So this is largely because of theoretically, under a set of theoretical assumption, this also offers a metric for quantifying the quality of information. Uh, I'm going to back off a little bit. So a step back is that, so we've been talking about the challenging setting when we have access, uh, when we don't have access to the ground truth. Um, but let me back off and thinking about that, uh, when the ground truth is available. So for example, for the weather forecasting setting, I can ask you to give me your prediction for the probability that tomorrow is going to be rainy. And I just need to wait until tomorrow and I will be able to observe the weather outcome. And that's the realization of the event. That's the outcome, that's the ground truth. And I can leverage that to reward you. It makes the elicitation problem really easy. So when the outcome is going to be observable, um, there is a very simple way of incentivize people to truthfully report their belief. That's called the strictly proper scoring rule. It's essentially a scoring function. Um, so R is an expert's report, the reported probability, and Y is the event outcome. So a scoring function is called proper or strictly proper. If given the agent's belief, whatever his true belief is P, reporting his true belief P will lead to a higher expected score compared with reporting any other value. So this is a, a clear like a incentive criteria. And uh, the simplest is strictly proper scoring rule is called the Breyer scale, or is often called the quadratic scale. It's essentially just the negation of the quadratic loss of the prediction. Uh, so it satisfies this property. Um, and so it's clear that the strictly proper scoring rule incentivize truth for reporting. So it has offered good incentives for uh, information elicitation. But what I want to focus on today is actually its other property. So the strictly proper scoring rule in some sense actually also quantifies the quality of information. And let me tell you what I mean here. So if I really think that there is an underlying true distribution of the events, P star. This can be unknown, but we don't really need to know it. But just to suppose that there is a true distribution P star. Then if I look at the, the Breyer scale, if someone reports a prediction R, so the smaller the distance between P, uh, P star and R is, so according to the, uh, the square of the L2 norm here, the higher the agents expect his goal with respect to the true distribution P star. So notice that this is a, when we're talking about it provides the right incentive, we're saying that if the agents has a true belief P, the according to P reporting truthfully gives the agents higher expected goal. But here it's actually saying that if the agents report a prediction that's closer to the underlying true distribution, then According to the true distribution, the agents are going to receive higher expected scale. And this, the difference between P star and R is a divergence. And uh, the, the lower term is just uh, the expected scale. 
And what's amazing is that it's not just for Briar scar, like for any strictly proper scarring rule, it has a similar property. So it's just a, the divergence are going to be defined um, according to uh, the KL divergence of some convex function. But there is a one-to-one -one mapping here. So, so in some sense, if we know the ground truth, just using a strictly proper scarring rule can evaluate the quality of a prediction over multiple tasks. But unfortunately, we don't have access to the ground truth. But we still hope that can we design something that can have a similar property that we can use the scar function to quantify the quality of the prediction. And I want to briefly talk about um, the idea behind the surrogate scarring rule without going into too much details. So we do not have access to the ground truth. But now let's suppose that we're in a still like an either setting. We have access to some noisy ground truth Z. So we don't observe Y, but we observe some noisy ground truth Z. But in addition, we actually know how the noisy ground truth relates to the underlying true ground truth. So we know the error rate of the noisy ground truth. So for the binary case, it's really just a, the E plus one, E minus one. So those are the error rate of Z with respect to my ground truth Y, which is unknown. So if we're in this setting, so this is inspired uh, by the learning from noisy label literature. So we can actually uh, correct the bias and defining a surrogate scarring function um, using any strictly proper scarring rule and to correct the bias. So there are other ways to do so. I'm just giving you one way of doing it. And, uh, uh, and this really, this is expressions coming from the, the learning from noisy label literature. Um, but the part that I want to highlight is that it uses a strictly proper scarring rule. So this can be any strictly proper scarring rule, but because we're not knowing what the ground truth is, we're using the surrogate ground truth, the noisy ground truth Z in place of the Y. Um, but because also we know the error rate, we're kind of like correcting the error rate um, you know, a certain way such that we have a surrogate function. And this way of correcting the, um, the error rate um, satisfy a nice property. That is that no matter what the true ground truth Y is, um, according to the distribution Z condition on Y, the expected surrogate scar just equal to the strictly proper scarring root scar. So now at this point, it seems that, okay, we're one step further. If we have access to some noisy ground truths and we know its error rate, then we can possibly just do this correction and we're back to a strictly proper scarring rule and we can use that to quantify the quality of the information. Um, but the issue is how to obtain this noisy ground truth and also understand its error rate. So these are actually the main contribution comes from when we're trying to define uh, the surrogate scarring rule mechanism. So I'm not going to go into too much details. So this is only possible when we're in a multi-task setting, uh, when we have like a N agents and M tasks and each task is randomly assigned to at least three agents. And we make some homogeneous and independent task assumption because the theoretical results will hold under such assumptions. But the operation of the mechanism doesn't depend on the assumption. And we actually are going to test it, um, the real world data, in which we don't know whether the assumption are satisfied or not. Um, and then essentially what we're doing is that we take a peer report as the noisy ground truth. And uh, we're using the methods of moment to try to estimate the error rate. And when the number of agents and the number of tasks are large enough, essentially the estimation of the error rate is accurate enough when we are applying the surrogate scarring rule in evaluating um, an agent's prediction we're in expectation 
just uh, applying a strictly proper scarring rule in evaluating the agent's prediction against uh, the unknown ground truth. So that's so this is this theoretical results hold under a set of assumptions. So it doesn't hold generally the hold under it doesn't need certain assumptions for this to hold. Okay. Um, can you theoretically do better if like instead of sampling a random agent, you do like standard crowdsourcing, like unexpectedly popular or the mode or any of those things? Yeah, so so we can do like average of multiple so that can uh, uh, help us with variance a little bit because the issue with this is that um, we need large number of M and N is because it's the estimation accuracy is only like asymptotically getting better and better. Um, so when we're doing average, we can gain a little bit there, um, but because we're doing a asymptotic result, so it's just a lot there to not stating that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so so hopefully that gives you some like intuition of, uh, oh, the pure prediction mechanism actually uh, might be useful for uh, providing a way of quantify the quality of the forecast. And uh, I talk about the surrogate sparring rule that we design, uh, but there are other like multi-task pure prediction mechanism and under certain conditions, they can all be viewed as corresponding to some underlying true accuracy measure with respect to the wrong truth. So for example, the, uh, the determinant mutual information and the correlated agreement are the two where they kind of are measuring the mutual information between someone's report and the true outcome. So that's a very sensible metric for the informativeness of uh, the forecast. And, and there is also the, the pure truth theorem that's related to weighted precision recall. Um, and our surrogate scoring rule and also the proxy surrogate scoring rule maps to the strictly proper scoring rule. And I want to emphasize that um, all this mapping are under certain theoretical conditions for the theory to hold. You can imagine that like a, we definitely need assumptions for this to hold. Um, but it gives us some clues of uh, what if we just uh, use the pure prediction scales to measure the expertise level of uh, um, the participants in our aggregation problem. So empirically, we can say that uh, they actually, uh, if we're looking at the pure prediction rewards of each forecasters and say that how accurate they are uh, according to the quadratic loss. Um, so the Breyer scale with respect to the ground truth, this is kind of our golden benchmark because we know the ground truth, um, has this trend, meaning that um, the Breyer scale of the top aggregator, highest Breyer scale aggregator, has the best accuracy, the lower is better. So our quadratic loss has a range of between zero and two, and zero is perfect prediction, and it's always guessing 0.5, that gives the scale of 0.5. And if like completely wrong, the opposite will lead to a price of like quadratic loss of two. So, um, and here is that like if we're averaging the top percentage of agents according to each metric, what's their accuracy? So as we have more and more agents, the accuracy approaches to just averaging everyone. That's prediction. Um, and these are different pure prediction styles. And they're highly correlated with the, uh, the strictly proper scale and rule, the broader scale one. So it does say that uh, it seems to be that they does offer information. And uh, this is empirically tested on 14 forecasting data set, which I'm going to go into a little bit detail about what those data sets are. Um, so that gives us the, the inspiration. So maybe what we can do is that uh, we have a bunch of benchmark. Uh, aggregators that we want to compare with. Um, so we have the mean, the logit mean, and we also uh, like choose a statistical inference-based method, the, the variational inference method. 
and also the the minimal pivoting, which is the Nicole mentioned, that's uh, based on the surprisingly uh, popular answer to derive the uh, the correct answer, uh, because these are kind of the popular method used in practice, and we choose this uh, fall method as the benchmark. And what we're going to do is that we'll first look at the benchmark's performance on the faulting data set that we had. So the faulting data set are the, so, so these are the four years of the Good Judgment project, essentially the, the first IAPA project. And these are the like three data set from the hybrid forecasting competition. Um, and then the oh, the M data set are from the uh, Dresden Prelex lab. The, they run experiments uh, collecting uh, like a predictions and forecast from human subjects. So some of the data sets are like predicting the, the price of art pieces. So we can imagine that there's a very um, large variance of accuracy there. And if we compare the, the baseline method, I think the, uh, the observation is that, um, so some method like, like the VI performs extremely well on some data sets but extremely worse on some other data set. So the highlight in red are the worst method for each data set. And the bolded number are the best method for each data set. And you can see that like the, yeah, the performance varies a lot across data sets. Okay. Um, and what we're doing is that, hopefully at this point it's very clear, we just use pure prediction mechanism. We compute the pure assessment score, and we use those scores to select the top experts. And we only aggregate using the forecast from the top experts, and we only aggregate using the mean and the logic. So we kind of like choose our base aggregator. Um, so we basically have like 10 aggregators, like the cross product of the five pure prediction methods and the two base aggregators. And uh, let me get into the, the result here. So, um, so here are the aggregation performance here. Let me explain what the color coding means here. And um, hopefully it becomes easier. So these are our benchmark, fall benchmark that we've already seen before. And as I mentioned, the highlighted are the best benchmark and uh, the red one are the worst benchmark, okay? Uh, and then these are when we're using mean aggregator as the base aggregator versus when we use logic aggregator as the base aggregator. Uh, and then the five pure prediction method that we used. Um, and the numbers that's highlighted in green are better than all benchmarks. So in a particular data set. So essentially if I look at this, so all this method are better than all four benchmarks. And uh, the yellow cells are second best to all benchmarks. So the yellow ones, they're not the best, but they're the second best. They didn't beat all the best. Um, so as you can see that, like, uh, we can't really say which method is the absolute best method across all data set. But hopefully this gives you a trend of saying that the pure prediction based method are fairly robust. They generally are either better than old benchmark or they're the second best. So they're rarely like a perform very worse. And, uh, and what we're highlighting is that if you look at this two data set and look at the, um, the VI method here, so the VI method works really well on this two data set, but the other benchmark performance are much worse. So it's significantly like a, a worse than uh, on this two data set. But our pure prediction based method has much less variance. And similarly, if I look at this three data set where the VI performs really worse, our pure prediction based method still performs fairly good. I have my last slide here, and let me just, uh, oh, actually second to the last. Uh, so we also look at the overall uh, aggregation performance in terms of the, uh, the mean squared loss and the standard deviation of the mean squared loss. And as you can see that this like reconfirming that the mean aggregator 
the simplest one is seems to be the best benchmark because it has low error and uh, smaller like standard deviation. Um, and these are the five mean based uh, uh, peer prediction aided aggregator. And this seems to perform. And, and the logic ones are the, the, the orange square. So they seem to have good um, accuracy and especially the mean one has smaller standard deviation. And we don't really exactly know why this happens, why this adds the robustness. Our conjecture is that because we use cross-task information, um, probably the way that we're using it made them to be better than the, uh, the base aggregator mean logic. It adds an additional layer of stability. And uh, let me try to conclude. So what I want to say is that the forecast aggregation seems to be like a really easy problem at first sight. <laughs> Just to have a bunch of numbers that we want to aggregate. Uh, like this seems to be like a mathematically a really simple question, but it seems to be fundamentally a challenging question because even in the nicest setting, it requires a, a large number of samples for a learning based method to work well. Uh, and the peer prediction based method um, actually in some way, I view that as it's a forecast dependent aggregator because I don't a priori have an aggregation function. So I have to look at my data and estimate my error rate if I want to use the surrogate scarring rules and then have a, a way of like scarring the experts and decide the weight and then do the aggregation. So in, in some sense, it's, it's a method that's depending on the forecast itself to decide the aggregators. So maybe that's the promising direction to go to think about the aggregation problem is that we shouldn't go after for finding the perfect aggregator because they don't exist. Well, they exist, it's not achievable. Um, and we shouldn't try to go after for a best aggregator for any scenario, but maybe there is a way or there is room for us to improve the robustness and also accuracy of the aggregators by looking at the problem or the questions that we have and the forecast for those problems. That's all, thank you very much. Sorry. Awesome, thanks everyone for coming. Um, yeah, perhaps we can sort of indeed with the time to take questions offline. Um, and sort of, I guess, final reminder, we do have two more learning machine seminars for the rest of the semester. One. Okay, we have one more. Uh, <laughs> we have one more seminar for the rest of the semester, day of July, next week, same time, same place. Thank you.